Hello and welcome to The Bike Show. As you can see, we are here at Rim and Rubber Bar and Restaurant in Greenside. And this chair here has got your name on it. If you want to come down and watch us do all this nonsense, then come down and watch us do it badly. Anyway, enough of my yakking. It's time to look at something green and very fast with Matt and Donovan. If there is one manufacturer that's kept ahead of the game with its superbike over the last few years, it's Kawasaki. They had a new ZX-10R long before there was a new R1, for instance, and let's not even mention Honda and Suzuki. And the effort to keep the green machine leading the way has really paid dividends. If you look at World Superbikes, it's won two of the last three World Championships, and with a bit of luck, it could have doubled that tally quite easily. Well, guess what? There's already a brand new ZX-10R, and here it is. It looks pretty much identical to the last model, but will it ride any differently? I guess there's only one way to find out. The first thing you notice about the new ZX-10R is that, from the seat, it's pretty much the same view as before, with an almost identical digital instrument display. Seconds later, you notice the next thing, which is that you're searching for a succession of higher gears at a faster rate than ever. Factor in the new quick shifter, and you have an engine that is easy to keep on song. Last year's ZX-10 was hardly slow, but that's the way it feels next to this new model, which reacts to the throttle more quickly and further down the rev range. On public roads like these, it's difficult, if not downright risky, to discover anything useful about the handling. So I head off to meet Dangerous Don at Pekisa, the ex-MotoGP circuit providing the ideal testing ground for a bike that is essentially a street-legal world superbike. We have a 2015 model along for comparison purposes, and it's immediately clear that the new bike turns faster and with less effort something that's particularly noticeable in higher speed corners. And then there's the brakes. With bigger front discs and Brembo's top M50 calipers, the bike now stops more quickly, while at the same time providing better feel, so you can trail brake even more confidently deep into a turn. Kawasaki also has its own version of cornering ABS, which takes into account lean angle, and so it can actually reduce front brake pressure to stop you standing the bike up and running a bit wide. Overall, the stoppers really are a significant improvement over the previous Takiko calipers. If getting into corners is now better, what about getting out of them? The traction control now has more adjustability and measures inputs over a wide range of motions like pitch, yaw, roll and acceleration. They're all measured via a five-axis inertial measurement unit that Kawasaki claims is now the most advanced on offer because it is primarily predictive rather than reactive. By adjusting ignition and throttle valves, the bike allows you to get that much closer to the edge of available grip, especially when you're still at maximum lean. It's very clever and it works, allowing us to get on the gas that much earlier, and crucially with much more confidence than we could even on last year's model. As you can see, it's pretty much a dead ringer for the bike it replaces, with just a few detail changes to the nose fairing and tail unit. The exhaust is better looking than it was too, even taking into account it is now compliant with the stringent new Euro 4 emissions regulations. At the front, the most obvious developments are to the suspension, which are now balance-free forks from Showa, and are a close replica of those found on the factory World Superbike machine. Not quite so obvious are the new alley frame and longer swing arm, designed to pitch just a little bit more weight over the front end. Also hidden from view is the new 32-bit ECU that offers an even greater range of electronic rider aids. As well as the expected traction control and ABS, there's wheelie control and launch control, and if you fit the race ECU, you can also unleash an auto blip feature for getting you down through the very slick gearbox. Perhaps the most important change is to the engine itself, 
where a lighter crankshaft reduces the moment of inertia by 20%. Max power may still be 197 brake horsepower or 208 with ram air, but the engine now spins up much more quickly and the engine is noticeably more responsive, which is a fair description of the bike as a whole. Well, Donovan, you were with me at the track, and fortunately, as you can tell us, we had the old bike with us, didn't we? Yeah, Four Ways Motorcycles was kind enough to lend us one, so we rode the old one first, and then we got on the new one. And you notice that as soon as you left pit lane, you know, you go down pit lane, you leave that little gate that says you're going onto the track, and in first gear, at low speed, you accelerate. And at that very moment, you suddenly go, whoa. Because you know the old one didn't have the greatest mid-range, didn't have the greatest bottom end, and that's what they've really worked on at this one, is that whole mid-range thing. And the moment you took roll on the throttle, there it goes. But it's still 197 horsepower, so... But it feels quicker, doesn't it? It feels a lot quicker. It does feel a lot quicker, but um, I do know there is one person who races ZX-10 Cup who ran one on the dyno, and he said it made 10 horsepower more than his old one. OK, so there's something amount. hidden away in there. So the, the, the lack of a crankshaft, actually, the lack of a crankshaft, the lack of a lack weight of on the, yeah, the weight, yeah. The lack of weight yeah. on the crankshaft just means it spins up that more quickly. Does, yeah. Now, I think it's worth saying that we were riding on Pirelli, Diablo, Rosso, three. Corsa, three, something, something or like others. Something like it, yeah. Yeah, so it's a new road tyre from Pirelli. They weren't race tyres, so you couldn't really lean on the front end that hard, could you? And you didn't have maximum grip, but it still worked pretty well. Yeah, they've got these um, balance-free forks. Now, we've ridden on forks similar to that, the Olin's FGR, and that was on full-walled superbikes with slicks and everything like that. And you can only really feel those forks when you're really on the anchor. So at the last minute, you really break. Where the standard forks kind of get a bit wobbly, the balance-free forks just stay stable. But we were on road tires on a track that was still slightly slippery, so... OK, well, let's get the uh, spec box up, and we can have a look. We decided on a rating of four and a half out of five, effectively 90%. Now, why did, why did we not give it the full five? Well, one of the problems with it is that it finally has a quick shifter, but where other people already have auto blip downshifters, so it's still a bit behind. Also, the, the mid-range is a lot better, but it's not quite it's not, as good. It's not great, is it? And it's, when they talk about mid-range, you're still yeah. talking... There's, there's not a lot below 7,000 RPM, so... Yeah, not a hell of a lot, but um, yeah, it could use a little bit more there, but other than that, it's perfect. Don't go away, because we'll be back after the break talking to a very famous man indeed, who is a South African hero. He's just finished the Dakar.